And so it's very important. My wife and I yesterday watched Case for Christ, Lee Strobel's story. And uh, I got to tell you, I, I, was, I was very thankful as I sat there. You know, I've been serving in ministry for, uh, as your pastor, 28 years, pastored another church for a year while I was in Bible college. So, you know, I'm getting close to 30 years in ministry. And I was very grateful as I watched the movie that I had the privilege of going to Bible college. And, and as a Southern Baptist, because we are a Southern Baptist church, and please don't forget the Annie Armstrong uh, offering, Easter offering, that supports all of our home missionaries. We did a great job, I feel, uh, for uh, the foreign missionaries, but we can't forget our home missionaries, how important their work is. Every, every state, uh, we have missionaries that are serving the Lord. But as a Southern Baptist, I was able to go to school, and I, I was a member of Clinton Road Baptist Church. That's familiar, isn't it? And we now are Cross Point Church because people say, why would you change your name? I think, well, this is pretty obvious. We are not on Clinton Road anymore. <laughs> but I can't say that anymore because we are on Clinton Road. So, you know, God, so it's like, well, we, you know, we, we decided we will never again uh, name a branch of our church after the road. Isn't that a good idea? We, we really, because that, that can change. And I want you to know I was privileged because, you know, almost 30 years in ministry and I felt a call to ministry in our church. I got saved in this church, baptized in this church. I became a deacon, was ordained in this church. Became a, I was married in this church. The biggest event of my life. One of the biggest events. And uh, became a deacon, and then all the deacons left, and I became chairman of the deacons. <laughs> we had very short meetings. And, um, and then we called a new pastor, and then I was calling the Bible college, and my education was $33,000 a year back then. And people like you, Southern Baptists, underwrote all of my education. I left would not. Owing. I, I had a bill for $400. I didn't know how I was going to pay it. And I didn't know, would they, they let you go when you owe money? <laughs> or did they put you in the back room or something until the next semester? And somebody from, I believe, our church found out what my bill was and paid it. And, uh, but in, in that uh, process of education, one of the things that were very dear to me is I learned things like the evidence for the resurrection because I knew I would devote the rest of my life to telling this story. And it's not a fairy tale. Aren't you glad? Amen. And it's the truth that God loved the world and he sent his son and he died and suffered under Pontius Pilate and he rose again and he lives forevermore Amen. to return. And in Case for Christ, here's Lee Strobel and he is married and through some events, his wife becomes a Christian. They were an atheist family. And he's confronted as a journalist for the Los Angeles Times that his wife now has gotten into a cult and some craziness, and it's, and it's disrupting his life, and it's disrupting his family, and he knows it's a bunch of phony baloney, and so he decides as a journalist to attack the resurrection on the basis of the evidence. And what happens in that story is that as he looks, and I was glad in Bible college, we talked about textual criticism. We looked at manuscripts. We looked at fragments of documents that date back to the second century. And, uh, and we looked at that in the, in the context of looking at things like the Iliad and the Odyssey and Homer's writings and Aristotle. And you look at these things and, and we, we have very little textual evidence on those minuscule, but when you look at the New Testament, we have over 5,800 and something manuscripts of the New Testament that date within 30 years of the actual occurrence. We have eyewitnesses. We have medical doctors looking in in the American Journal of uh, Medical, whatever you want to call it, looked into the resurrection and can make no other determination based on the flogging 
the damage that would be done to the muscular system, leaving a person either dead or in critical condition because of blood loss and hemorrhage and all these kind of things. And then finally, when we read in Scripture where they took the spear and put it in Jesus' side, the Gospels faithfully record that blood and water issued from the wound, which the doctors will tell you that cannot happen unless a person is dead. And we have it, and, 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 and then you begin piling up the evidence and the testimony of women, because mainly in the New Testament, it was the testimony of women that was not even regarded as viable in court in those days. And so why base an argument on the weakest evidence you could possibly find unless it was true? And it was. And I want you to know uh, your faith is not in vain. And your faith is not futile. As sure as I'm standing here, our Lord rose from the grave. Amen. And he is alive forevermore. And here is the thing. Well, praise God. Give the Lord a hand, you know. Here's the, here, here's, here's the thing. As a, as a man who is a journalist and the evidence, he has to make the decision. And as a journalist, you're, you're bound to, if you have a hypothesis and the evidence proves one way or the other, you are bound to proclaim the truth, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, whether it matches what you thought. And uh, in the movie, of course, Lee Strobel liked C.S. Lewis, who was an atheist, agnostic, and then finally a devout Christian, great defender of the faith gives his life to Jesus. But here's the thing. When he's, we're looking at the grand motive of it all, and he is standing with a, a, a church man who has, has evidence of things like the Iliad in the audience uh, under glass and fragments like the moratorium fragment and others like that. And uh, what, if Jesus had the power and he had the authority not to be crucified. Why did he do it? And the simple response is, the person in the movie says, it was because of love. That's the only reason why someone would do that. Can you say amen? amen. And so, as we've been talking about relationships, I, I want you to know that this love thing is really what it's all about. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. And in our day and age, we have so many misconceptions about love and the fact is, as many Christians like myself, although we talk about love, we sing about love, we're really lousy at love. Because of our misconceptions, our misunderstandings about it. And I'm so glad that God cared enough about us that he made sure that he came in person, aren't you? And he also preserved his word. And wow, did he preserve it. And uh, compared to the other historical documents we have, the evidence in the New Testament could be powered from floor to ceiling in this room. Not true with the others. And so he has preserved it for us. And so what has God said about this all-important thing, love? And I really like what Bourbon did this year. Did any of you see Bourbon's invitation to the Baptist Builder trip? See, I'm a pastor. I have to get everything in somehow or the other. <laughs> and he, 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 at the beginning, he says, you know, usually we go to places with people that we are like. And we generally serve people that kind of talk like us sort of, and uh, look like us, smell like us, because, you know, that's where we're comfortable. But this year, the Baptist builders are going to a place where the people don't look like us, they don't talk like us, they don't sound like us, they don't smell like us. And uh, he said, we're going to build a church, and it's uh, three congregation, Chinese, Cantonese and an American or English-speaking congregation. Those three congregations have 300 members. 
and they are meeting in a place that's very difficult, but they have the financial resources to be able to erect a almost 20,000 square foot building, and we're gonna go and we're gonna do that. Amen. Amen. And uh, I'm already signed up, my wife's already signed up. I, I was glad, I didn't even talk to her. I didn't say, honey, are you going? She just signed her name. I said, Woo, that's, uh, praise the Lord, <laughs> that's good. We didn't have to have that conversation, so we're going. And, uh, and, I, and I'm thrilled about that, and, and I was really surprised because you know I thought it was a Haitian congregation, but if you're from Alabama, Asian sounds a lot like Haitian. And uh, when we got there, we were looking for all these black people, and there weren't any in the place, and they were all Chinese, and we felt like, are we, we got in the wrong stop or something like that. But, uh, but it's really sometimes difficult, isn't it, for us to love people that are not like us. For people that don't look like us, don't talk like us, don't think like us, don't smell like us. And so, you know, God commands us to love, and, and today this is what I want to talk about. How can you and I become a more loving person? If love is what it's all about, and if love is the paramount and pinnacle of Christianity, how can we become better lovers? Because frankly, we're lousy at it. And so we're going to look at the scripture, and this is what God says about it. It says, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from where? Love comes from God. God is love, the scripture says. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And so one of our modern misconceptions about love, and I don't know if it's always been like this, maybe it has, but a popular misconception is love is a feeling. And I want you to know that's not what the scripture says. Love is not a feeling. Feelings come and go. Emotions are like waves. They're here today and they're gone tomorrow. And you say, why do you say that? Because I hear people say things like this. They've been married 25 years and they say, I don't love you anymore. And the fact is, is what they're really saying is I don't feel like I love you anymore. Because you never loved at all if all the love you had was a feeling and it was an emotion because it's not. And God commands us, and you can't command an emotion. I, I can't have, any of you have like grandchildren and things like that? Any of you have some of those or you work with kids? And they have this emotion, and have you ever tried to talk like a six-year-old out of their emotion? It just doesn't work. And I grew up in a day and age when you would hear something like this. See if it sounds familiar. Stop crying. Because if you don't stop crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about. How many of you remember those days? They put some of us in. That was the real, you know, compassionate approach to dealing with those kind of things. I, I think we've grown up a little bit. We try to console and we try to comfort and things like that. But the fact is, is that sometimes... They just are in a mood. Have you ever had a wife in a mood? And, and, and guys, have you ever tried to talk your wife out of, your, out of their mood? You ever hear about getting blood out of a stone or anything like that? It's not happening. And as a matter of fact, I can't. Sometimes, don't you just feel moody? And our, our moods tend to be circumstantial, like I'm, I'm praying for my tax preparers right now. Are you praying for your tax preparers right now? I'm praying for mine because people come around and they say, oh, I got a, you know, the tax reform, I got a good return coming, and mine haven't been done yet. So guess what I'm praying for? Okay, I'm not a little biased, right? I'm, I'm praying that I would get a return. Now, if I get that and I go down there and they tell me, uh, good news, you, you got some money coming back. I'm going to be all smiles, but then if they tell me, well, I just wanted you to know, you know, you got to come up with a check, then guess how I'm going to be? I could tell you before I even get there. My, I don't live by faith with my emotions. I really don't. It's spur of the moment when it hits me. 
And, uh, and so I'm going to be kind of sad. I'm going to tell you right now. But if, if, if that's what love is, do you realize the consequences of that? That they rise and fall in every wind and wave and turn and this kind of thing. And I'm telling you, that's not what God says that, that love is. Now, in every one of us, and I try to draw a picture, we all, we all have a body. Aren't you glad your body's here today? And uh, you wouldn't be here without it. You have your body. Inside your body is your spirit. And uh, when God originally made man, this is what the scripture says, he blew his spirit. The life of God was blown into this lump of clay. And he became a living soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And although our bodies are not like God's, and we have this temporal body, and we always will have a housing, even a spiritual body, the Bible, and that's a big subject. We'll go on, and then finally the resurrection body uh, later on, and I don't want to get into that today, but inside of you, uh, the way you're like God is, your spirit is, you have a mind. How many of you are glad you have a mind, even if it's half a mind? <laughs> even if it's quarter of a mind, you have a mind. Okay? And then you have a will. And then you have your emotions. And uh, what happened was, is in the garden, when, when man rejected God, the spirit of God that lived inside and governed and controlled the mind, will, and emotions of Adam and Eve, now the spirit became exterior, and that's why he convicts from the outside. But praise God. Isn't it great that God has given us these spiritual components like himself? Because... If you want to today, if it is your will, you can turn to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith and the Holy Spirit of God will come and live in you and begin influencing your mind, your will, and your emotions and be conforming you into the very image of Christ and your creator. That's an amazing thing. But you gotta remember that uh, the spirit became exterior, and he certainly could convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. But it was no longer an inside job. And guess what happened to man's emotions? Instead of being having the emotions of God. Now, would you say that the human race is emotionally out of control? And would you say at times that you get emotionally out of control? And what happens is, is people like Ravi Zacharias will use the age-old illustrations about that here are feelings and facts and they're on the top of a wall. And if feelings lead, or excuse me, faith and feelings, if feelings lead our faith, you're prone to fall off the wall. Have your feelings ever as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, ever caused you to fall off the wall? They have for me because they are misleading and they are like an indicator on a dashboard. They go off and they tell you there's something wrong. And you could take the hammer and you could smack that light, but something's still wrong. Amen. Tried that with my car. Never worked. Put a piece of tape over the light. You ever try to do that? That'll fix that. Boop, put that on there. I like it. No longer that light, you know. And if there's a noise, you just pull the wire on the noise, and the noise is no more. Everything's good. No, it doesn't work that way, does it? So, but if faith that is based on fact is leading the way, we can stay on the wall. Amen? And so, uh, because we are emotionally kind of we live our lives toward and I, most people I know and that's why you hear statements like this from people they're just not feeling it anymore they could go through so much stuff together as a couple and then all of a sudden like the feelings are gone and they're ready to split and I'm telling you that's not real because emotions come and they go and so we got to realize, and, and I'm so glad that God has given us a will, and the reason why this is important is because God does not suggest that we love one another. 
God commands that we love one another. You cannot command a feeling. It's much deeper than that, and it goes to our will. And so what I'm telling you this morning is love is not a feeling, and love is not uncontrollable. It's not the Italian approach to love. When the moon hit my eye like a big pizza pie, that's amore. It's not chemistry. I had a chemistry set. How about you? And we talk about moods and we talk about stuff. Your emotions can be changed by what you eat. Did you know that? And you say, oh, I'm not so sure about that. Do you know that there are kids even in our church and the big answer to everything was Ritalin. Do you remember those days of the Ritalin? Let's get Ritalin and just let's smear Ritalin all over everybody, you know, and it's going to just make them all good kids. And I'm telling you, no. You know what they found? They changed the diet on these kids and a lot of people, and guess what happened? They didn't need Ritalin anymore. It was just a dietary problem they were having because their chemistry was all messed up. But I'm telling you, love is not chemistry. Have you ever heard two people say, we, we just are connected? And, and we have good chemistry. Well, I had a chemistry set too. And once in a while, things would go boom. That's what happened. And, that's, and it's not, right? So what is love? Love's a choice. Did you hear what I said? Love's a choice. And you say, why do you think it's a choice? Because that's the way the scripture always paints love, as a choice, a volition. It's an act of your will, whether you feel like it or not. And God commands it. And I sure am glad that's the way he does love. Because God's made a choice to love you, whether you're lovely or not whether you have a good day or you have a bad day, whether you perform well or you perform terribly, God's love is always the same. Amen? Whether you get an A or an F, he still loves you the same. And that's the way he should love us. He says we should love one another. And notice what the scripture says here in the book of They say I took too long this morning, so sorry. (laughs) This is what it says. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So all the virtues in the Bible, what do we got to do? Over all of them, we got to put on love. I don't know about you, but I'm glad you wore clothes today, okay? But how many of you just, you know, you got up and you went over to the closet and you looked in there, and I know some of you got 100 pairs of shoes. I'm not going there, okay? I'm leaving you alone, all right? And, uh, and I know guys have lots of clothes and that kind of stuff, but like one fella said, you can only pair, wear one pair of shoes at one time. You can only sleep in one bed. Isn't that true? Bobby, don't take my coat. <laughs> I'm not going to give my coat away. I went to the closet. There was stuff hanging in the closet. And I made a choice, didn't I? Yeah. And I chose, which isn't hard for me, because I have three black jackets. <laughs> and I rotate them regularly. Aren't you glad that I choose to, <laughs> to rotate them regularly? And so I chose. And, and this is what the scripture says. When it comes to love, it says, put it on love. It's a command. And I made a choice. And I put on my coat. I could have chosen not to wear this coat today. But I chose to wear this coat. And when it comes to love, that's exactly what it is. So we put it on. And so uh, love is a matter of conduct. And this is what the scripture says. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. What does that tell me? I'm going to tell you what. I've had enough conversation to last four lifetimes. How about you? Have you heard enough words? Have you? It's very perilous for me to stay because I'm talking to you right now. (laughs) 
But we hear a lot of words. We hear a lot of stuff. I hear a lot of things. But talk is cheap. Amen. I'm sorry, but I'm in that camp. Don't tell me you love me. That's easy. It rolls off the tongue. It sounds like it's impressive. But it can be empty and shallow if it's not backed up by actions. Can you say amen? And that's why we got to act. And I'm so glad that God didn't say, I love you, I love you, I love you. And I'm telling you what, it's not a feeling, it's not your chemistry, it's a choice. I really don't think that Jesus thought, oh, I feel like the cross. You know, th this, this is going to be good. I mean, I'm really feeling it. I, 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 it's going to be, it's going to be great, you know. Uh, my disciples, one's going to betray me, one's going to deny me. The rest of them are going to run like rats. But I'm feeling it. I'm going to be in a garden, and I'm going to be tempted, and in all these kind of things that he went through. And then these Roman soldiers are going to come, and they're going to spit in my face and beat me to a pulp, and make fun of me. But I'm feeling it. Is that what love is? As a matter of fact, it gives me a little indication when he was in the garden and he was sweating drops of blood. He wasn't feeling the cross. And when he said, Father, if there's any way you can take this from me, three times he asked. He wasn't feeling it. But he made a choice. And I hear the choice, don't you? Nevertheless, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Amen. And by the volition of the Lord Jesus Christ to leave heaven and come to earth and overcome every temptation and every test because he desperately loved you. In me. That's love. And that's what he's asking me and you to do. It is not words. It is a conduct that we have. I don't think Peter was feeling bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. Do you? He didn't want to associate with these people. He didn't eat like those people. They looked different. They smelled different. They were pagans. And most of them were on their way to hell as far as he was concerned. But then God delivers this bass, or this cloak, and there's animals, rise up and eat. No, Lord, not me. I, 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 no, no, no. Nothing unclean. And he finally got the message. It wasn't talking about food. It's talking about people. Then Peter brings the gospel to Cornelius' house. Aren't you glad he did? If he didn't, we wouldn't be here today because most of us are not Jewish. Did you notice? And I, oh, I know, Bobby, Paul was really feeling persecution, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, this is going to be good. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to, please, if you ever go on a vacation, never book a boat ride with the Apostle Paul. <laughs> no airplanes, no cruises. You know, if you want to go with Ravi Zacharias or Chuck Swindoll or somebody, have a great time, but don't go with Apostle Paul. Shipwrecked three times, left for dead, stoned, whipped, all those kind of things. Oh, yeah, I'm really feeling it. Can you imagine? I just can't imagine this. I, I don't think I have it in me unless God would give it to me. You go and preach, Bobby, and sometimes the audience is not very kind. But at the end of your message, they take you outside the city, and not only they sing like, that wasn't very good. They take stones this big and they throw them at you until you look like you're dead and then they abandon you because they hate your guts. And it amazes me because a guy like Paul who knew what hatred was all about could get up and go right back into that city. And there's only two reasons why. Because he loved God and he loved those people more than he loved himself. That's love. Wow, that's love. And so how, how do you love somebody you don't like? 
How do you love somebody that you really don't like? And I just want to ask you, do you have anybody in your life that irritates you? I heard that. And so did God. Do you have anybody that's hard to love? Anybody that's not like you? Anybody that you avoid? Do any of you have some like exes in your life? Like an ex-girlfriend or an ex-wife or an ex-husband or an ex-pastor or an ex-church? Can you have an ex-church? Yeah, you can have an ex-church. And so how do, how do you love? Well, God commands us to love and it's not a feeling. How do you do that? And the first step is this. You got to experience God's love for yourself. Because you can never give away something that you really don't have. Amen? And this is what the scripture says. It says, I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your heart, living Bible, different translation, living within you as you trust him. May your roots go down deep in the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you be able to understand, get this, how long, how wide, how high, we used to do this in kids' class, and how deep the love of God is. Have you experienced the love of God? There's nothing like it. To know that your Father in heaven loves you and chooses to love you just the way that you are, it blows me away. He's able to overlook all my faults, all my failures, and love me still. And that amazes me. And when that love hits your heart, it's a lot better than when the moon hits your eye, like a big pizza pie. Can you say amen? And in the book of Ephesians, you know, it, 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 that's what it tells us. In Romans, I love this verse in Romans. For I am convinced. Can you believe this? Have any of you have a Christian really messed up in your life after you become a believer? I mean, just really blown it. And, uh, and you wondered, can God still love me? After I knew all that I did, I still did that? I still acted like that? I still said that? And this is what the scripture says. For I am convinced that neither death nor life. That's pretty inclusive. Is anybody outside of that? Death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers. Does that leave like anything out? And then he goes, neither, neither height nor death nor anything else in all creation will be able to do what? Separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And when you experience that there's no separation, there, there is, God will not love you any less, and he's not going to love you any more. He loves you completely. You got all of God's love right now. And, and, and if you're going to really learn to love someone you don't like, you're going to have to forgive others who have hurt you. I think Christians really struggle with this forgiveness thing. As a matter of fact, I preached on forgiveness probably four or five weeks ago. Bobby talked about it not long ago in a message. You know what? I could preach about it every week because it's really hard to forgive. Have any of you felt like you've been betrayed? Have any of you felt like you've been completely abandoned, stabbed in the back, deeply, deeply hurt? And not only do we have a habit of like we hurt each other once, how many of you have been like wounded in the same place over and over and over again and it gets hard and it gets old? And it's funny because... You know, people that you're having a hard time loving, do you know the reason why they are acting angry and bitter and rude and resentful? Do you know why they're like that? Because they don't, they don't know what real love is. And this is the hard thing. Who, how many of you say, 
oh, I want, uh, the pastor's going to put a sign on the wall and he's got all these really hard to love people and I'm signing up, I'm going to write my name and I want to go and be with that person and I know that they are angry and bitter and mean and resentful and hard to get along with, argumentative. How many of you are going to run over and sign up on the list and say, I'll take that one? No, Why? Because we don't, we don't want to. We have enough trouble. If, but I'm telling you what, there's people out in this world who need the love of God, amen? amen. And they're going to come through these doors. And they may be here today. And they're a mess. And you and I got enough trouble in our lives. But God has said what? He's commanded us. You don't have to feel it. You need to do it. Because people desperately need love. Hurt people hurt people. And until they are loved, love changes everything. And we need to love people. We need to love them, but we have to forgive them. And this is what the scripture says. Forgive whatever grievances, you'll find this in Colossians 3.13. Forgive, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, Forgive how? As the Lord has forgiven you. And here's the deal. You may think as a Christian, oh, I don't have to forgive that person, and I can go on and be just fine. And I'm telling you, that's not true. Your bitterness and your resentment and your unwillingness to forgive somebody is going to affect your relationship with God, and it's going to affect every relationship in your life. If I don't forgive a church member, is that going to affect my love for my wife? Absolutely. If I don't forgive my brother, and there's some of you here, how many of you had a difficult father? Don't raise your hand. God knows. But maybe he never gave you any approval. Maybe he never gave you any affirmation. Affection was hard to find, and it hurts. And you're asking the question, where was that guy when I was growing up? And you can carry that to your grave. And do you think that that's not going to affect your relationship with God? I'm telling you, it's baloney. So we have to forgive. And we forgive how? As the Lord has forgiven us. If you don't forgive, you know who you're hurting? More than anybody else in the world. You're hurting you. And if you want to be free to love your wife, you want to be free to love your God, you want to be free to love your neighbor, you want to be free to love your pastor, and believe me, he needs it. <laughs> I'm glad I got one amen out of that. You know, I may be the worst EGR person you have. Do you know what that means? Extra grace required. I may need more grace than anybody else, but I need it. And so do you. So forgive others. You have to do that. And then you have to think loving thoughts about that person that you're having a tough time with. If you're having a tough time with somebody right now, it might be me. Maybe you're having a tough time with me. I, I want you to begin thinking loving thoughts about me. And this is miraculous. And you say, how does that work? Look what the scripture says. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And it goes on to say, who being the very nature of God, did not consider that a quality something to be grasped. But instead, he humbled himself and he took on the form of a servant. Isn't that what the scripture says? And then therefore God highly exalted him to the highest place because he laid down his life for others. And somehow, I don't understand this, but here is the second person of the Trinity. Have you ever heard the expression that you got to somehow put yourself in the other person's shoes? And somehow Jesus, I don't know how he did this, second person of the Trinity was able to take and put himself, as a matter of fact, he took on human flesh, so that he could put myself, himself in my shoes. 
And if I begin, and I got this person, this irritant in my life, this hard thing, it might be my, right now it might be my wife, it might be my kids, it might be my neighbor who lives next door, and I'm having a hard time, and he's irritable, and I don't love him, and I'm, I wish he would move, and all these other kinds. When if I start thinking thoughts like this, I wonder what that guy's hurts are. You see what you're doing? You're getting out of you. That's hard to do. How many of you think of yourself most of the time? I have that real problem. Matter of fact, I, just yesterday I said, Lord, I don't want to be so self-centered. I keep coming back to that. I just keep coming. Whenever I have trouble in life, it seems to come from my self-centeredness. How about you? And I keep coming back and I say, Lord, I don't want to be a self-centered person. And he said, well, you got to get out of yourself. Stop thinking so much of yourself and start thinking about others. Now, suppose you're a wife here. What does that mean? If you're a wife here this morning, you got your, the wives are really slow. They're cautious right now. <laughs> Okay, they're really, they're looking at me and they're saying, I think I wish he would keep going. <laughs> what does it mean to be a wife and to get out of you and to begin thinking about your husband and asking this question? Here's you are. I'm so hurt by him. He did the same thing again. He said the same thing. How could he? We, uh, what would it mean? Somebody tell me. I'm making this real. I'm not letting you go, folks. <laughs> What does it mean? Could it possibly be he's so cranky because there's something that's hurting him? Could it be? Could, could it be that, you know, you're sitting here and you say, I got all these problems, no one's helping me. And these kids don't understand all my problems. Could it be that your kids have got some problems? Have you ever thought of that? And could it be that, you know, that neighbor that you just can't get along with, maybe your neighbor's got some needs, not just you. And when you start realizing, gee, this person is such an irritant, this person is such a problem, this person who bugs me, this person I don't want to be with, this person I don't really love, and it can be in your home, has hurts, problems, and needs. Guess what you figure out? By golly, you're a lot like me. And so you start thinking loving thoughts towards that person. You change your mind. And here, I'm going to give you a really good thing. I didn't bring, make this up. Rick Warren, I don't know where he got this, but he said, I must begin, you must begin acting in a loving way. It's a choice. And see if this helps. It is easier to act my way into a feeling, and I'll illustrate this, than to feel my way into an action. Amen? I'll say it again. It is easier to act my way into a feeling than to feel my way into an action. And so here I am, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a married guy, long time, and uh, I could get, you know, maybe negative feelings toward my wife sometimes. Is my wife a sinner and am I a sinner? Can that ever happen? But when I begin remembering the good stuff, can you say amen? When you start remembering the good stuff, like I just sitting on the couch because I was reflecting on this sermon. I said, I'm just going to remember some of the good stuff. And the Lord said, remember that time you got that 20-foot camper from your mother-in-law? And you had that Bronco 2, and you had that nutty idea that that little Bronco 2 was going to carry that 20-foot trailer all the way to Maine. And you decided to take the dog, too. And do you remember what that was like, driving down the highway and the tractor trailers would almost suck you into the side and it was knuckling the whole way and you didn't know how to back the trailer in and when you got to the trailer park, you got caught in between two trees and, uh, and then you're out there in the rain and then the dog is, is, is a mess and do you remember that? And I said, man, that was a blast. 
We had a good time. I can remember when we saw our first tide pool. I didn't even know what was water. The tide comes in and the tide goes out and it leaves some water and you can get down there. And here I am with my kids and we're looking at blue crabs and all kinds of stuff and we're from New York and we don't even know what the ocean is. And we had a ball. And then I began thinking about other times and stuff that God brought my wife and I through. Folks, what happens in a matter of that much? That much. What happens? Man, the feelings start, the good feelings start coming. Can you say amen? amen? The good feelings start coming. Now you can be here and you can be thinking about church. Can you, you can be thinking about your marriage. Is there junk in our marriages? Is there? Is there junk in our relationships? Yeah, there is. And if that's what you focus on, if that's what you set your mind on, is if that's you keep thinking about her faults, his faults, their faults, guess what's going to happen to you? I'll guarantee it. What you focus on is what you'll become. Peter had a focus problem. You remember? Here he is. And uh, the Lord Jesus is out on the water, and what is? G- and, and Peter says, "I want to do that too." I love Peter, don't you? What a nutcase he was! <laughs> yeah, I, I want to do that too. And uh, Jesus says, "Come on!" I like that about Jesus, don't you? Come on, big boy! Does Jesus know what's going to happen? I almost believe sometimes that Jesus probably got down the waves and just was on his hands and knees laughing about what was going to happen, you know? Just just totally, this is going to be good. You know, he just knew it all, didn't he? And so Peter's making his way, and then all of a sudden the waves and the wind came up, and uh, Peter was intently looking at his master, focusing on Jesus, who was walking on the water, doing the amazing, the miracle, the miraculous, And that's where he wanted to be. But he took his eyes off and he got it on all the other, everything else but Jesus. And let me tell you, what happened to that guy? Man, gravity took hold and did its thing and he went down. But this is the amazing thing. Did Peter refocus really quickly? Because that's what the scripture says, shortest prayer in the Bible. Lord, help! (laughs) And that hand sat down in the water, grabbed hold of Peter, put him up on top of the waves. And I believe with all my heart, he walked back to the boat. I don't believe Jesus carried him like a little baby. He walked back on the water. You know, I don't know about you and me, but that's true about me. When it comes to love, if I focus on the Lord, I do really well. But if I start getting my mind and my eyes on the wind, and, and folks, is there a wind Are there waves? Are there circumstances that you would never expect in a million years? And they look like they're going to take you down. And they look like they're going to take you under. And you're never going to get up again. But if you put your eyes on Jesus... Hallelujah. You put your eyes on love. And you overcome. I don't have long to go, but Jesus said this very quickly. Jesus said, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Luke 6, verse 27 and 28. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. So, this is four things. You got these quick? So people that are hard to love, I need to do this for them. Number one, I need to love them, whether I feel it like it or not. Can you say amen? Got that? Write it down. The next thing I need is I need to do good to those people. You, you would be surprised. Now, if you're mad at your husband today and you're having a tough time with him, he fits the enemy category. <laughs> okay? And so, you need to love that guy. 
If you're having a hard time with your wife, I'm going to tell you right now, you need to love her. It's a command. Don't wait for the feeling. The feelings will come. They'll come back. I'll show you that in a minute. And then, uh, if you're having a hard time with your friend, you need to good, do good to your friend. Does that make sense? Yep. The opposite is to do what? I feel like doing bad to them. Have you ever prayed for somebody? Like the country western song? You know, I prayed that uh, you get hit by a truck, and I prayed that, you know, that, that, that kind of stuff. Have you heard that? That's not what I'm talking about. You pray, and, and, and you do good to them, and you pray for them. As a matter of fact, the blessing. When they used to bless in the Old Testament, what they used to do is, you remember when uh, uh, here is Jacob, and he's blessing the, the brothers, he, he, his sons, excuse me, he put his hand on them, and he pronounced a blessing. And for uh, you'll see this, and, and what it is, it's the pronouncement of positive encouragement. If you ever wanted to bless a little child, when the scripture says that the little children came to Jesus and he blessed them, do you think he just stood there with his hand to his head and didn't say anything? If you want to bless somebody, you got to say something. Amen? And Jesus put his hands on those little children and he pronounced a positive encouragement for their future. And so here's your enemy. So go home today, take your hand, put it on your husband's head, right? Put it right on his head. And you say, Lord, bless this guy. I mean, bless his mind, bless his heart, bless his way. Bless my husband, Lord. And you say, well, that's only when he's good to me. <laughs> Guess when he needs it most? And I'll talk to any man in here. Man, when you're out of sorts and you're having trouble and you're not very nice, what do you need from your wife? Just be honest. What do you need? You, 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 need, you need your wife to come and be good to you and treat you better than you deserve. Then you'll feel ashamed of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll say, what happened? This Christianity thing is real because she should hate my guts, but instead here she is praying for me. What a mess I am. Thank you for being patient. I think it's worth it. And then you, you need to bless them and then you need to pray for them. We, we talk about praying for each other. Do you really pray for your enemies? Do you, do you really pray for them? I mean, pray again, not the country western, you know, thing, but uh, really, really pray for them. And uh, if you love someone, you will always believe in him and always expect the best of him. That's a living Bible translation of 1 Corinthians. You remember in 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to do some stuff with 1 Corinthians later on. Huh? And, uh, and then here's how to rekindle a love, and this is, I'll be done, okay? Aren't you glad? Um, Revelation 2 says this. Yet I have hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. This was a good church. But when Jesus got to the end, he said, you got a real root problem. You lost your first love. As a Christian, can you lose your love for God? Yeah, you can. And you can wake up sometime feeling like you're a million miles away from the God who loved you, died for you, rose again for you, and lent her seeds for you right now at the right hand of God. But the fact is you're not talking much. You don't read his word. You don't have a lot of faith in him anymore. And he's kind of distant. Do you think that he knows that? And the fact is, is that you've left your first love. Can this happen in a, in a marriage where you kind of lose your love? Absolutely. Can it happen in, between brothers and sisters? And Yes, it can. Can it happen between good friends? Yes, it can. Can it happen in a church? Yes, it can. And this is what the scripture simply says. You have lost your first love. Remember how you have fallen. So you remember and then repent. What does it mean to repent? It means you're going in this direction and you make that, is it 180? 
Yes, thank you. Never was very good at geometry. You make that 180 and you turn back to the Lord or you turn back to that person. And then here's the simple thing. You do the things you did at first. So uh, here's a couple struggling today in our congregation. They're really having a tough time. And believe me, Satan is out to kill, steal, and destroy your relationship. I just want you to know that he'll do anything he can. He will do anything he can to steal and destroy your relationship. He's a killer. Never forget it. He's not playing around. And, uh, and so here you are, and the relationship is really struggling. You've got to go back and do the things you first did. And I'm telling you what, it will change your heart. So if you were a guy and there was that girl and you sat down and you used to write love letters, has any guy ever read a love letter in here? Anybody guilty? Come on, guys. Isn't there some romantic person? Oh, there's one hand out of it. Oh, boy, I'll tell you, we're in bad shape. We can't dance and we don't write love letters. What a Baptist church we are. I'm telling you what. Does anybody play cards in here? You know, whatever. You know, I watched Netflix the other day. Whoa. Be careful. So, if that's what one and wooed your wife, five years into the marriage, kids, problems, routine, no more love letters. Maybe you took her out on a date. Maybe you did something fun. Maybe you laugh together. Can the laughter die in a house? Can it be an old memory? It can. Maybe you used to dance, and then you became a Baptist. I feel sorry for you. <laughs> you get what God's trying to say today? Me too. It's easy to say you love people. It's impossible to do without God's help. But thank God, we have a God who loves us.